Some questions are hard to answer. Perhaps the question I'm most commonly asked is the question that's most difficult to answer. It's asked by many different people in many different situations. I've tried to just keep track of the times I've heard it recently. John asks the question. He's on his third round of chemotherapy. He lost his wife to cancer just two years ago. Debbie asked the question. Her husband left her for another woman right after she gave birth to their first child. Some friends of ours, a young couple, they asked the question. For years they've been trying to have a baby. They would be beautiful parents. But every month ends in disappointment and every month the question gets a little bit louder. Tom asked the question. His daughter works as a prostitute in Los Angeles. Lance asked the question. His two-year-old son drowned in their backyard swimming pool. Many people have asked the question, and it usually goes something like this. If there's a God in heaven who is all loving and all powerful, then why is there so much heartache? If God really is in control, then why is there so much pain? Theologians have struggled with the problem of pain for centuries. It's easy to give glib answers about suffering when others are going through it, but when it's your child in the hospital, when it's your job that's been eliminated, when it's your marriage that's falling apart, those answers seem shallow at best, maybe even insulting. While there are some sound theological explanations for the problem of pain, I've learned that none of them make the pain hurt less. The truth is, the question of pain and suffering is much more than academic. It's not just a theological issue that you debate over your lunch break. It's much more personal than that. You have gone through pain. You're going through suffering. And you want more than answers. You want some hope. A reason to keep hanging on. Not long ago, I took my three-year-old daughter to the doctor to get shots. It's one of my least favorite things to do, especially at that age, because she's old enough to know how much it hurts to remember the pain, but she's not old enough to really understand why it's happening. She's too young, too immature to fully comprehend why her daddy would be letting her get poked with needles. And even though I'm not the one doing it, she knows I'm the one allowing it to happen. As we drove to the doctor's office, I tried a number of tactics to try to ease her growing fears. First, I told her, Macy, your pain has a purpose. And as she screamed from the back seat and tried to jump from the moving vehicle, I listed the potential consequences of not getting this shot, but she didn't seem interested. She didn't want to know why this pain was good for her. I tried to tell her that it wouldn't last long, that the pain would be over soon. It would only last a moment, but she's three. She lacks the perspective of understanding that it'll only be a few seconds. We get to the doctor's office and we sit in a waiting room and she's still yelling. She's still trying to escape and I just grab her, I wrap my arms around her and I sit her on my lap and I whisper in her ear and I say, Macy, Daddy knows how you feel. I have to have shots sometimes, too. She took a deep breath. She calmed down. She took that um, stuttered breath that people sometimes take between sobs, and she looks at me, and she asks to see my Band-Aids. I said, well, I had to take the Band-Aids off, but I showed her where I'd gotten shots in the past. And she seemed to be at peace. Somehow, knowing that I knew how she felt, somehow that made all the difference. The book of Hebrews says that Jesus is able to sympathize with us in our pain. So when Jesus says, I know how you feel, these are not the words of some 
shallow politician. He knows what it's like to suffer all the hurt that this world can throw out. When he went through the excruciating pain hours before his crucifixion, it meant that no matter what pain I go through, my pain is understood. And when I look at it that way, and that makes all the difference, it changes everything. There are many ways this world can wound us, many kinds of hurt we can feel. But when we look at the final hours of Jesus' life, we see that he experienced them all. In the Garden of Gethsemane, Jesus experienced the anguish of emotional pain. He knew what was coming, the unbelievable trials he would face, and the emotional pain would have been overwhelming. As he went off by himself to pray, he told the disciples, My soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Luke 22 says, Being in anguish, he prayed earnestly, and his sweat was like drops of blood falling to the ground. Medical doctors now explain that extreme anxiety can cause the release of chemicals that break down the capillaries in the sweat glands, releasing a small amount of blood into the sweat. Think about that for a moment. The emotional pain of Jesus was so intense, it actually caused him to bleed. So for the woman who wipes a tear off the divorce papers, for the parent who picks out a casket not much larger than a shoebox, for the person who walks into the restaurant and once again has to say, table for one, Jesus says, believe me, I know how you feel. But Jesus also knows the deep wounds of relational pain. He spent three years of his life investing in his disciples, leading them, teaching them, loving them. They were his closest earthly friends, more like brothers really. But in the span of a single evening, they turned on him. One of them used a gesture of love to betray him, handing Jesus over to torture and death. And in the hour of his greatest need, the rest abandoned him, fleeing to save their own skins. And to top it off, one of his closest friends would repeatedly deny even knowing him. So for the child who's left alone to play at recess, for the husband who finds a note on the nightstand saying it's over, for the daughter who lays awake on her birthday waiting for her dad to call and say, I love you, write this down. Jesus knows how you feel. But this world can cause more than emotional turmoil. It can deal out more than relational suffering. Maybe what you've experienced is the agony of physical pain. Well, Jesus understands that too. The Jewish leaders take Jesus to see Pilate, who is the Roman governor at the time, and they demand for the death of Jesus. Pilate doesn't want to crucify Jesus, mostly because he doesn't think Jesus is guilty of anything. And the enemies of Jesus gather together a large crowd and the people start to demand the death of Jesus. Pilate's not sure what to do. He's afraid that if he doesn't give in to their demands, there will be a riot. And if word of a riot gets back to Rome, it could mean big problems for Pilate's political future. So with no easy options, he comes up with the compromise that he hopes will appease the crowd. For a beating like this, a man was stripped of his clothing and his hands were tied to an upright post in preparation for the scourging. The soldiers would use a whip of braided leather thongs with metal balls woven into them. When they would strike the flesh, these balls would cause deep bruises, which after enough blows would break open. The whip would also have pieces of sharp bone, which would literally slice through the skin. The objective of the soldiers was not to lash out quickly and inflict welts. Instead, they would try to rake the victim's back. 
Oftentimes, people make the mistake of thinking that Jesus received 39 lashes, which was the traditional punishment given by the Jews. But Roman scourgings were much more severe. The number of lashes wasn't what the Romans paid attention to. They were experts at beating a man to the very edge of death. But the torture doesn't stop here for Jesus. The soldiers assigned to torture Jesus aren't satisfied with shredding the flesh from his body. They want to degrade and humiliate him as well. Scripture tells us they were like bullies circling a smaller child, pushing and jeering. They find a thorny branch and weave it into a mock crown, imitating the coronation wreath of Roman leaders, and they press it into his head. And when that bores them, they spit in his face and repeatedly strike him in the head with a staff. When I read this in scripture, I went from sad to mad. Now I understand the necessity of bloodshed. Just as the blood of the Passover lamb freed the Israelites from bondage and saved them, it's the blood of Jesus that sets us free and saves us. And the Bible says that without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. And I understand that in order for us to be freed and saved, a violent price had to be paid. But the mocking, the taunting, the spitting in his face, why? Why doesn't God do something? But it's important to understand that the suffering Jesus experienced was not forced. Jesus suffered willingly, and so his suffering must have had a purpose. The question is, what was it? Well, if the death of Jesus carries the promise of salvation to those who repent, then I believe his suffering carries the promise of compassion to those who are hurting. It means that whatever pain you or I go through in this life, he knows how we feel. And if we can hold on to that, it really does change everything. A few years ago, I did a funeral for a 25-year-old man who died of a drug overdose. On the day he died, I sat in a quiet room with his mom. She was a single mother. This was her only child, and she was in incredible pain. She was a Christian woman, but she was very angry at God that this had happened. And I was young. I probably tried to say more than I should. I explained to her that God was with her when she hurt, and that he understands the pain that she is going through. In the middle of my explanation, through her tears and anger and frustration, she started a sentence. She said, what does God know about? And then she caught herself. I don't know for sure what she was gonna say, but I think she was gonna say, what does God know about? losing a son and then she stopped short we both realized and we sat in silence and I don't know maybe you are misunderstood by your family maybe you're overwhelmed by stress maybe you've been disappointed by friends maybe you're physically hurting well listen God knows how you feel when you hurt, he hurts. Now maybe that's not the answer to the question you were hoping for, but it seems to me that knowing that he knows and knowing that he cares, it seems to me that that makes all the difference.